Hello everybody, Economic Ninja here. I hope you're doing well. There is a lot of news to go over today. I have four news stories I'd like to bring you and they all say the exact same thing. They all come or bring us to the same conclusion. And that is the economy is in a very situ serious situation. However, the great news is that the sheeple have not figured it out yet. You see it, you are following it, and it is important to follow this kind of news. Why? Because it motivates you to do something about it. Where most of your family and friends don't care, they uh, believe that ignorance is bliss. Type one if you've actually had a family or friend uh, say that to you while you're trying to warn them. And they are in that mode. They honestly are. So we're going to dive into these news stories and just a quick synopsis of what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about bank volumes tumbling, um, bank loan volumes actually tumbling. We're going to talk about uh, the jobs report, some inside information, a little glimpse into what's really going on in that those jobs numbers. Just blowing my mind that the stock market isn't tanking right now because if people realized what was going on with the jobs, they'd see what the future is. We're gonna talk about a warning that's coming out of JP Morgan, very important to go over, and then we're gonna be talking about Tesla. And it tells the whole full story of the auto industry and what's going on. By the way, everybody that has the uh, Auto Trader Pro course, I just uploaded two new uh, lessons, so go take a look at that. All right, so here we go. This is the start of it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna record the time right here. Here we go. First story. This is out of Zero Hedge. Bank loan volumes tumble despite surge in deposits. Money market funds are hitting right now a new record high. It says after two weeks of relatively quiet flows, last week saw a massive $64 billion inflow into money market funds. This is the biggest inflows since the Silicon Valley Bank crisis to a new record high. All right. People do not trust their banks anymore, and they also do not trust that their money is now keeping up with inflation. I said this years ago, that in this coming inflation wave, everyone's going to become an inflation expert. Everyone, everyone, everyone. Now, it's ironic that everyone around us, our family and our friends, our coworkers, they all understand that we are experiencing inflation. They complain about it. They whine about it. Or they go, well, this is just the way it is, right? Because they're defeatist and they have no comprehension on how to make money from this. Um, but what really blows me away is that none of them care to do anything about it. This is why markets build up and why markets crash. It's because of lazy and greedy people. That's it. That's why you see people uh, getting taken advantage of by thieves in the comment section down below. I will never ask you for money and I will never tell you I'm going to invest your money. That's not what I do for a living. But greed and laziness is what usually people go off of, and that's why they get taken advantage of. If you can't take care of your own money, then this is why banks become wealthy. They rob the middle class. All right, I'm sorry, I digress. Um, it says here, both retail and institutional funds saw massive inflows last week into these uh, money market funds, accounts. The Fed's balance sheet, continued to contract down $64 billion last week to its lowest level since 20, June 2021. I want to remind you of what uh, Jerome Powell said during his remarks in July when the, he raised interest rates. He was talking in a very slow tone, and then he sped up really fast to say one sentence, that we will uh, continue to dramatically reduce, drastically reduce our balance sheet. This is what I want you to understand. The Federal Reserve does not want toxic crap assets on their books before everything crashes. If you look right here, this is a chart of the Fed's balance sheet. Right here. This is the beginning. This is the ending. You see how the balance sheet spiked up dramatically during COVID, right? And now it's dramatically dropping. To give you an idea, this chart started in June, or sorry, May of 2021. And we are back to May of 2021 balance sheet numbers. It's because they do not want to be holding the bag on assets that are underperforming or non-performing. Okay? Please understand this. They don't want this crap. Why should you want it? All right, so let's go back. 
says here, but banks, the bank's usage of the federal emergency funds facility remains at record highs, which is about $108 billion. So let me show you this chart. Again, this is the beginning right here on this side. And this is, uh, uh, this beginning right here is uh, uh, February, around February of this year, right? And right here, we're at record highs. Why is it plateaued? Is because right now the Federal Reserve is helping the maximum amount of banks that are going under right now. And it takes a certain amount of money for them to maintain their liquidity, to keep their uh, deposits in line with the amount of loans that they have out because they're not making any new loans to stay in Basel III requirements, okay? Banks are hemorrhaging right now. So it says here, so with the bank's balance sheet being plugged and after last week's crazy divergence between uh, SA and NSA uh, deposit flows, we wait with bated breath for what the Fed has in store for us this week. Now, SA stands for uh, seasonally adjusted and NSA stands for non-seasonally adjusted deposit flows, okay? On a seasonally adjusted basis, total deposits jumped $40 billion last week. For once, non-seasonally adjustable adjusted deposits went in the same direction with a $52 billion inflow after last week's $85 billion outflow. And removing foreign banks flows, domestic banks saw inflows on both seasonally adjusted and non-seasonally adjusted basis. The gap between SA and NSA deposit outflows since the Silicon Valley uh, Bank remain very high, which is around $116 billion. The key warning sign continues to trend lower, which is small banks reserve constraint. This supported above the critical level by the Fed's emergency fund for now. After an ugly week for bonds following the ugly month of an ev even uglier quarter. See, things are diminishing quite rapidly. They're going down faster and faster as we speak. They go on to say, we sure hope these banks are planning to fill the $108 billion hole in their balance sheets that they are filling with expensive Fed loans. Because these Fed loans keep getting more expensive as the Fed raises the, uh, the rate. So now that's the bank uh, loan volumes, how they're tumbling, right? They're not putting out new loans, okay? Which means they cannot get more uh, new business, new capital coming in in the form of interest, right? Also in the form of fees that they charge you when they, they give you a loan, okay? So that's really bad. So let's move on to the next story. And that story right now is this. This is again out of Zero Hedge. It's about the jobs report. Now let's go over the numbers and this is truly gonna tell you. And let me ask you this, a quick poll. Type two if you think the employment is strong right now and type three if you do not think employment is strong. Now while you're putting in your votes, casting your votes right now, I want you to understand or think about it this way. The Federal Reserve needs more unemployment because the more people that get laid off or fired from their jobs, they, uh, they need uh, people to stop spending. So when people get fired, they get laid off, they stop spending their money, right? Um, this is very interesting because what's happening is the job numbers are showing strength, right? If you're just a headline reader, if you look at it and go, oh, job numbers are strong, this is great, but it's actually really bad. And I'll tell you why. And actually, can I ask you really quick for a massive favor? Is there any way you could hit that thumbs up button and maybe push a comment in the normal comment section if it's available? because I wanna wake this algorithm up to get this information out to people because now that we're in October, we're gonna see things, we're, we are seeing things drastically change. Striking across the country is happening. Things are getting fundamentally worse. And we have a ticking clock now, a, time, a countdown clock into 2024. And 2024 is gonna be a scary year as we go into the elections, if you know what I mean. So here's the deal about everyone's cast their votes. It looks like mostly it's threes, people casting their, their vote for three. Inside today's job report, 885,000 full-time jobs were lost. 1.127 million part-time jobs were added. Record multiple job holders. Think of that title in and of itself. It says, after last month's stunning payroll report, when our post-mortem 
in our postmortem, we revealed not only a, a year full of monthly downward data revisions, but also collapse in full-time jobs and a surge in part-time jobs, as well also the worst unadjusted August payroll since the Great Recession. We thought that nothing could shock us anymore, and then we got the September jobs report. We won't spend too much time dissecting the report since regular readers are all too well aware of this. It says, first, 336,000 jump in headline payrolls. That's what everything was hitting the headlines. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, the Fed is, you know, it, it's, it's bad. You know, employment is really strong. But it's not. It's the biggest since January, or it was was stunning when considered that it was not only above the highest Wall Street estimate, but it was a six sigma beat to expectations. How is it possible to get such an outlier print to not only trend, or not only trends, but expectations? It says, if as the BLS claims, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in September, the jobs market suddenly reversed a year of declines, Surely there would be some quantitative or qualitative uh, validations to this quantitative outlier. Unfortunately, looking through the supporting evidence, we don't find any justification to the BLS's exuberance. And that's what we're going to go over right now because it's very important. Here's the household survey. Here, instead of a number anywhere close to the 336,000 jobs gained, the number of newly employed workers was just 86,000, which is the lowest since May and the second lowest of 2023. Here's a 2023 chart starting here and ending up over here. So we are seeing the headlines of the news stories are telling you one thing. Jim Cramer is telling you one thing, but the facts are totally different. So as of right now, we're sitting at just 86,000 newly employed workers, right? All right, here we go. Thank you, BG, for the uh, super chat. Since the number of unemployed workers also rose to 6.36 million, okay? That's the highest number since January of 2022. The unemployment rate was at a sticky 3.8%. Because now you're like, well, what is employment truly defined as? Is it defined as 40 hours? Is it defined as 30 or 20 hours? All right? And it says, it, it, and that employment rate, unemployment rate, refused to drop to 3.7 as the consensus has had expected. So it says here, if unadjusted total payrolls rose by 585,000, and yet private payrolls dropped by 399,000, that means, and you get it, probably you're already figuring this out, in September, all of the unadjusted jobs came from the government, which added a whopping 984,000 jobs, which mostly were teachers. All right, so we have a situation where headline readers and algor trading algorithms are, are getting this information and they are seeing, oh my gosh, jobs are strong, so we're gonna trade this way, but they're not strong. We are losing full-time jobs around the country. We have more underemployed people and a record amount of people having to take down two or three part-time jobs just to make a living. What that does is that adds stress into and on top of the average everyday worker. It causes confusion and stress. These are the two things that cause most investors to lose everything, confusion and stress. And right now, that's happening all around the country through the employment numbers. You also have to remember that non-full-time employees rarely, seldomly have health benefits. So they're either having to go get their own, pay for their own, or they're going without and taking the gamble, okay? All right. Now it says here, this, this is important. 
to not forget the number of multiple job holders is what we were just talking about. Those unlucky souls which have to work not one but two jobs to make up ends meet under Bidenomics. Type four if you think Bidenomics is working. I'll wait. All right, type five if you think Bidenomics is a total lump of crap. It says here, uh, also multiple job holders are double and triple counted when it comes to the establishment survey. The number increased by 123,000 to 8.1 million, which is the highest since January of 2020. As for the much more accurate unadjusted number, well, that soared from 7.7 .7 million to 8.1 million, which is an increase of 600 and uh, 300, sorry, and 68,000. We are in serious, serious trouble right now. But I want you to understand. Jerome Powell says it is his job to make higher unemployment, and he is. Right now, companies are laying off full-time workers, or they're not replacing them when they retire, or they quit, and they're replacing them with part-time employees. This is going to add to stress. When this housing market uh, comes down, think of how, less, how many less people will be able to go in, even if they're fully, in, they, they're, hey, I've got two part-time jobs, and the banks go, yeah, you know what? We don't like your employment history. We don't like that you're working a couple multiple uh, part-time jobs. Something can go wrong. Yeah, you haven't been working for one of them that long. It's not good. They're not going to be able to qualify for homes, even if they're able to hold their crap together and keep their credit score together during this crash, which most of them will not be able to do that. Okay? Let's move on to the next story. Now, the next story is a, a warning. Let me record the time. This, this is a warning from JP Morgan. Marco Kalanovic braces for a 20% market plunge, delivers a recession warning. Now, this is important because I've been talking about a sharp and quick crash in equity markets. That's what I believe we're gonna see here because the markets don't know and traders do not know which way to go. They don't know which way to trade. This is very confusing to them. Also, thank you to everybody that just, I think like 300 people just hit the thumbs up. Thank you so much, it really helps me out. And thank you, Lulu, for the uh, uh, super chat. All right, JP Morgan's Marco Klavonovic, Klavonovic is bracing for a 20% sell-off to hit the S&P 500. According to the Institutional Investor Hall of Famer, the high interest rates are creating a breaking point for stocks. And choosing cash at a 5.5% return in money market and short-term treasuries is a key protection strategy right now. Now, ironically, that protection strategy is also causing the failing of the banking system. Why? Because M2 money is, is contracting. It's a big deal. Thank you so much, AD, for the super chat. We are in a position right now where people are pulling out their deposits. So M2 money is contracting. We haven't seen M2 contract really since the uh, crash of 29 and around that area, that time frame. And so people are racing to this high interest yield and it's hurting the banks really in a bad way. He goes on to say, he says this, I'm not sure how we're going to avoid it. He's referring to recession. If we can stay at this level of interest rates, the firm's chief market strategist and global research co-head told CNBC's Fast Money yesterday, the S&P 500 closed at 42.58 on Thursday and is on the cusp of a five-week losing streak. The index is down more than 5% over the last month, which most people would think that's nothing, right? Kalonovic believes the weakness isn't a strong sign a, a monster move lower is already here. He indicates a near-term bounce is still possible because of a lot hinges on economic reports over the last in the next few months. And those are what I'm referring to, even some of these today, where they're, they're coming out and they're looking really good, like we're gonna avoid recession because employment's picking up, but it's not. It's not the right type of employment. It's not full time. It's not gainful employment, right? And so coming into these, like I said, these next three months are gonna be so key. But I'm gonna tell you right now, they're not gonna be good reports. And by January, the eventual guaranteed demise, the announcement of a recession will be here and then people are running for the hills, all right? 
He says here, we're not necessarily calling for an immediate sharp pullback, he said. There could be another 5, 6, 7% upside in equities, of course, but there is a downside and it could be a 20% downside. He warns, the magnificent seven stocks, which includes Apple, Amazon, Meta, Alphabet, Nvidia, Tesla, and Microsoft, are amongst the most vulnerable to steep losses due to their historic gains amid high rates. The group is up 83% this far, carrying the bulk of the S&P 500 games. This is so classic and such a setup for the dot-com bust of what we saw the NASDAQ back in, what, 2000. And you have a handful, seven stocks that hold the bulk of the value of the S&P 500. And think about how many people's uh, retirements are in those, how vulnerable we are to a downturn. How easy would it be for those stocks to all average 10 to 20% losses? What would that do? Well, it would cause a, a chasm. It would cause a cataclysmic event in the stock market because people would cause, it would generate fear and we'd have more sellers than buyers. The job market, he says, is still strong. I completely disagree. Type six if you disagree, type seven if you agree. The job market's strong because he's saying it. He's quoting headlines. The job market is strong, but, it, but you are starting to see the stress in the consumer if you look at the short the sort of delinquencies in credit cards and auto loans, he noted. That's the next story we get into. This is going to be crazy. We remain somewhat negative still. See, the thing is that this is double speak out of JP Morgan. They're telling you this thing's going to crash, but they're saying, don't, don't liquidate everything you have invested with us. I hope people understand what happens in these markets and why it's such a big deal. So let's move on. Since he already talked about the car market, let's talk about the auto industry, okay? And again, to everybody that bought the uh, Auto Trader Pro, Pro course, uh, two new lessons have just been uploaded. Loaded. Um, so go check that out. Okay, here we go. This is out of CNBC, and this started at 22. Perfect. Tesla cuts Model 3 and Model Y prices in the U.S. after car deliveries fall. Isn't that crazy? Tesla has went through, I think, six rounds of price cuts in the last 13 or 14 months. This is absolutely phenomenal. That shows the fact the economy is cratering. The government can't give you a credit big enough. The loan company can't give you a loan that's cheap enough to get enough people to buy cars. I don't know, and, and that's what blows me away, that people only look at the price of car. Well, the car price is expensive, so the car market must be doing good. No, it's not. We've, we've tanked, and then you're about to see the massive foreclosures or the, the, the repos. You're about to see Meacham, which is already, they've been telling you for the last six to eight, nine months that car prices are falling, but you need to stop looking at your local dealer. But if you want to look at your local dealer, um, look at the ones that are now offering 0% financing through their own corporate uh, lo loans. They're, they're out there now. Um, there are certain cars they, they got to get rid of, right? They don't do it at all cars. Go look at the inventory building up. Inventory is building up everywhere. And to the companies that can't build enough cars because they didn't think about their supply chain and how vulnerable it is to geopolitical risks, um, <laughs> then um, they're going to just fail. Like, I don't see a bright future for Kia, honestly. I just, I don't. So let's talk about Tesla, because everybody loves Tesla, right? Well, Elon Musk is definitely smarter than the rest of those CEOs, or maybe has less pride, because he started drastically cutting Teslas um, last year, and he said the auto apocalypse is, among, uh, is here, right? It says here, they cut the Model 3 and Model Y prices. It said... Uh, they, they cut both those model versions in the U.S. after the company reported third quarter deliveries that missed market expectations. The starting price of the Model 3 is listed at 38009 on Tesla's website, down from 40002 uh, previously. The long-range Model 3 fell from 472 to 459 and the Model 3 performance fell from 50900 to 53200 Tesla's Model Y performance sport utility now starts at 52,400, down from 54,400. All right, now you go, okay, these are a couple thousand bucks. But you have to remember, Tesla's been drastically cutting their cars for 14 months. 
Beginning at the end of last year, uh, Tesla began cutting prices of its cars across the world in a bid to stoke demand amid concerns over slowing consumer spending in markets like the U.S. and China, and as competition in electric vehicle space ramped up. Tesla regularly tinkers with the price of its cars, especially in the biggest markets of the U.S. and China. But the latest round of price cuts comes just days after Tesla reported third quarter deliveries of 40, 435,000 vehicles, missing, missing analyst expectations and marking a decline from the previous quarter. Tesla put the fall down, put the fall down to factory upgrades, which caused manufacturing sites to have downtime. Elon Musk has made no secret of the car makers' desire to chase higher volume over bigger margins this year. So far, that has paid dividends with the stock, which shares up over 100% this year. Tesla is still looking to deliver 1.8 million cars this year. Let me know, let me know down below. Type uh, eight if you believe that Tesla is going to pull off their 1.8 million vehicles this year. Type nine if you do not think they will. The point being is this. The economy is crashing. Elon Musk saw the uh, opportunity to try and grab market share and grab uh, ex-faithful you know, Prius drivers and ex-faithful Hyundai drivers and so on and so forth and bring them into the Tesla company, right? Um, he still, he can only bring in so many. And the fact is, they're trying desperately, and they're, I think they're going to move into a losing campaign a where they're going to lose on vehicles just to try and grab customers and then sell them things on the back end, like performance upgrades, you know, software upgrades, things like that. I think you're going to see that next. But the fact is, the car industry is dying because credit's dying, because the economy has died. And the only difference between someone that is intelligent and can see this ahead of time and someone that cannot is it someone that understands cycles and time delay. This time decay, time delay. And once you realize all that, you start to really put this together and go, all right, I see this. I'm getting ready. I'm going to be prepared and not scared. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. Hope you got something out of this. The Economic Ninja is out.